Good morning, folks. Sorry, I'm a little late. The core meeting is just wrapping up now. Um, so, unfortunately, we're not going to have Adam or uh, uh, Gabby today. Uh, they're both out on PTO, so uh, we won't end up talking about their, their proposal today. But uh, I do have some stuff I wanted to talk about with Science Store. Uh, before that, though, uh, let's see. The core team is probably going to arrive here in moments, I'm guessing. So I think I will just get this going right now. So uh, PRs. Uh, haven't done this in a while. I've been on PTO, so haven't really looked at it closely. But with the, all the work that's going into Quincy, there hasn't been a ton of new stuff. In fact, I didn't really see anything that was uh, really new over the last couple of weeks coming in. Um, feel free to add it if there's something that I didn't see. Uh, but there were a couple of different closed uh, PRs, so I'll start on those. Um, there was a PR from Matt Benjamin on the RGW side that uh, improved performance when you had uh, different logging that you were looking at. That PR got closed um, without being merged. I'm not totally sure why. If Casey, are you here? No, it doesn't look like we have Casey. Well, I'm here. <laughs> oh, Matt, <laughs> <you're right. laughs> that, 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 that PR isn't really relevant to this meeting. That that, that simply changed some move some logs around. It, 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 the, 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 the customer that reported that mentioned that they were paying in a, a huge, uh, there, there's a lot of overhead from logging in their environment, so, but, but this doesn't do anything it's super interesting. Okay. And also, okay. It, it's also closed because I guess you would like to move, to change the implementation to, to be adding a new front end logging that has some of the stuff that's more verbose and take it out of the main RSW subsystem log, nothing super interesting. Okay, okay. Well then, uh, moving on, uh, Josh Solomon's PR for improving uh, performance in some rare cases in the balancer, that finally merged. Uh, we do not have Josh today, uh, and I don't see Laura. So um, I think she did quite a bit of the review on that PR. Um, I don't remember exactly which cases this actually helped in, but um, but they both have been doing a lot of work on the balancer, trying to make it better and, and improve it. So um, my guess is that that's not the only PR we'll eventually see in this. Uh, but for now, uh, general improvement, look at it if you're interested. Um, there's a PR for using the thread local pointer uh, to save the shard. Amen. I don't remember much about this PR. It did merge. Who looked at it? Laura looked at it, and Kefu actually looked at this. Ronan looked at this PR. Is Ronan here? Ronan, uh, do you remember much about this? This is which the one? So I missed. I missed. The uh, this is. This is 44479, use the thread local pointer variable to save the shard. I'll link it in the window. I think you had maybe looked at this at one point, but uh, yeah, I didn't know it Yeah, it was a while ago, and one second. Um, I didn't think it was anything drastic or important, but yeah, yeah, I'm I'm guessing not just based on the description. Trying to remember what I said, huh? Anyway, I reviewed it twice, but uh, nothing. It works. Nothing. I don't think it will be much. Yeah, that was that was kind of my impression too. And, and no performance testing results or anything, but it theoretically it's better. So, um, okay, moving on then. Uh, testing test testing classic perf test with the performance tag. 
from Chris. Um, let's see. I have to get my window back open. Uh, do we have Chris today? I don't think so. So that got closed, um, but I do believe he is still working on trying to uh, take some of the work that Kefu and, and Radic and others did with running Jenkins performance tests for Crimson and having those actually run tests against our, our classic code as well. Um, so that particular PR maybe was closed, but I think he is still working on the general idea. Uh, so not sure what happened there, why, why we closed that one, but in any event, um, I think that work is, remains ongoing. Uh, and the last one I had for closed PRs, um, the Igor's work on speeding up pool removal uh, by introducing collection list prefetch, that has been around for a very, very long time. And um, that was closed by Laura. I'm not sure why it got closed other than the fact that it's, oh, Igor said that that's legacy now. Mark, it's very old uh, PR. It was superseded by <clears throat> another PR, so it's okay. It makes no sense to keep it. Did did the the one that supersedes it? Did we merge it, or is it something new? Uh, not yet. Uh, that's uh, this new PR is uh, PG removal. Still wait and review and, uh... Okay. Sounds good. All right. So uh, updated PRs. Uh, I only had three in my list. Um, one is uh, this one for setting uh, tracing compiled in by default. Uh, this is on the RTW side, or sorry, the, the RBD side. Um, and I think Casey's also looking at this, but uh, the thought originally was that this uh, had fairly low overhead. I think there are plans to merge this. It went through some testing, and then um, for whatever reason, I, I don't know if it didn't pass that, but there's been more updates and more discussion on it. So that has not merged yet. Um, and And, still is, I think, actively being looked at. Um, do we have anyone from that group that was looking at it here? Casey, you're here. Um, have, you, have you looked at that recently? This is the, the uh, trace point stuff. Um, right. Yeah. I, uh, I haven't heard any recent results. Uh, Performance-wise, I know that they switched to some tracer sender that batches things instead of sending everything synchronously, and that, that helped quite a bit. But I don't know what the, the latest numbers are. OK, OK. I can report what you've all told me last week, or I think it was last week, that the, that the, that the, that the overhead from when with tracing disabled is now below 1%. The overhead with tracing enable is about is about fifteen percent. Like to fix that too, but the first the focus is on the first one of those. When you say tracing is disabled, do you mean that it's compiled in but it's no, disabled? No, precisely compiled in but not okay. executing traces. Okay, yeah, under one percent. That's that's not bad, right? That's maybe maybe worth it. All right, cool. Well, it'll be exciting to see what they what updated numbers they have after some of that work. Um, okay, uh, next PR, uh, this is just a doc PR for rewriting the hardware docs. I was, I think, tangentially involved in some of this sort of, but I've, I've not been super good about reviewing this. Uh, but Dan from CERN has uh, been kind of reviewing it, I think. So uh, hopefully hopefully that, that's to people's satisfaction, uh, primarily the CPU section. Um, you know, what our have hardware recommendations upstream are right now. A lot of that, that documentation was quite out of date. Um, okay, and the last one, uh, MDS PR, 
or skipping inode with cap iteration for empty directories. Uh, this is from Patrick. Um, it looks like there were some bug fixes and more discussion going on there. I don't know if we have anyone from the CFFS team. Greg, do you do you uh, uh, remember much about this PR? Not offhand. Sure. Um, okay. Well, I think his active discussion is still ongoing. So uh, that's it for that. Um, lots of stuff in the no movement category, but I think the only one here that's maybe I, I would want to follow up on uh, immediately is uh, we do want to get the TCML thread cache size moved into a stuff configuration option. So I'll try to follow up with Adam on that one. Uh, for containers, this makes it a lot nicer to be able to change that setting uh, on the fly rather than needing to change the basically Ceph deployment in the container itself. Um, so yeah, that's that's probably something that we should try to get in sooner rather than later, I think. All right, so uh, there were some comments. Oh, before I move on, anything I missed from anyone that they'd like to talk about, any PRs? Okay, so um, Kenneth uh, from SoftIron uh, had posted in the chat window um, that uh, there has been some ongoing work looking at Nautilus specific performance regressions. I've done, I did quite a bit of work on that before I went on PTO and, and they've been doing quite a bit of work on looking at that as well. Um, so uh, Kenneth had mentioned here that they've been doing a lot of performance testing on their side and noticed a few things. Um, so I guess they're testing on ARM. It was yeah, new to me. A little noisy where I'm at, but I'll, I'll unmute. Um, so apologize. Good, good, yeah. yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Kenneth. Most of our, you know, most of our hardware is, is ARM. We're actually using um, the AMD Opteron A1100, you know, Seattle chipset on a lot of our storage nodes, especially the density boxes. So that's that's a little unique um, versus what, you know, a lot of folks are doing. Our, our higher performance boxes, the NVMe nodes, specifically our, you know, AMD Epic, a little more, um, you know, normal, I guess, for what, for what most other folks do. Um, we... Merge, I don't. So a couple of a couple of folks on our team have more info than me. I wish they would have joined, but they're they're busy. So I'm kind of you're getting secondhand or maybe third hand information here. But um, they showed me a graph this morning, uh, merging in some. Uh, there was apparently some assembly changes on ARM for uh, what ISAL. They poured backported that to Pacific, um, recompiled, and noticed a pretty substantial performance, you know, increase. And also apparently. Uh, our GitLab CI, where we're building, where we're doing our Ceph builds, wasn't setting in you know, a release with debug info, the CMake build type, and that made a pretty dramatic difference. Um, yep. <laughs> that, especially at the larger block sizes, that made a huge difference. Um, we're pretty close. There's still a gap. Like Pacific is still, you know, demonstrably slower, especially on ARM than Nautilus. Um, we haven't quite figured it out yet, but you know, we're we're much closer now, at least. Okay. The thing that that is, is frustrating or it was frustrating for me when I looked at this is that when I looked at the master branch going back when I've done tests in the past I've seen kind of this progression where Pacific looks better than Nautilus and you know we, we, we see like good behavior and it's all great and then we start doing backports and then when we do backports we introduce regressions but we don't backport the optimizations so then we ultimately end up seeing a situation where all of a sudden now, like, you know, Pacific looks worse than Nautilus when when we initially tested it, it looked better. Um, that that seems to be a, an unfortunate trend, which I guess means that we probably need to be doing a lot more performance testing on backports, which isn't going to be fun, but maybe is a requirement going forward. Yeah, we're, we're thinking about testing when, since we have such tiny caches on our ARM chipsets. <laughs> We're thinking about building with uh, what there's a CMake option, what min size or something like that. What is it? So you're gonna think if that made a difference. Um, hold on.
I don't remember. Okay, no, no worries. Uh, you can just email it or whatever, post to the mailing list. Um, yeah, yeah I'll, uh, I was gonna give you an update when I had something more useful, I suppose, rather than anecdote, because um, anecdote isn't very helpful. But we're going to try try changing some of some of the compile time options on on ARM since the the cache sizes are so tiny on those on those uh, on those chipsets. And seeing if that made a difference. Sure, sure. Also, what's interesting is um, at least again on ARM, I don't know why this would be different, but we have about a 10% performance drop running running the daemons in containers, running them in Docker versus not, which I wasn't expecting to see that either. And it's pretty consistent across the same uh, compile time options, the same linker options, um, and the same Ceph configurations, just moving them into containers. On ARM, for us, we see about a 10% performance drop. How many cores do you have per chip? Yeah. We have eight, typically eight. Okay, are they all local, like not like a new node type thing? Um, yes. Okay. I, my first thought was that there might be some like locality issues that when you do it, go into containers, like screws that up. There's networking, some kind of container networking uh, uh, abstraction, right? There is, yeah, I was wondering that. Um, I haven't looked deeply into it, and I'll admit my understanding is uh, probably elementary school level. Um, I was wondering if, if there was some sort of like socket or networking communication that was the bottleneck um, being introduced. I've, I've seen some really like high level performance numbers showing like a similar drop in containers. And I think the the thought or the hypothesis was that it may be related to the network stack, but I don't know that anyone actually followed up and really dug into it in any kind of meaningful way. Sure. I mean, it, it doesn't matter to us a whole lot. I mean, we, we make stuff appliances, right? So we, we'll just run natively and it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't really yeah. matter. Yeah. So, yeah. But it was, it was interesting to see. Um, and that, that definitely drives my decision on whether we're going to Docker or not, or Podman or what have you, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, and I, that's that's the struggle I go with too because like a lot of the stuff that I run, the performance tests are are on bare metal, specifically right. because I really don't want other random bottlenecks including you know the 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 info we get out of this. But then it means that we're not necessarily running in the same way that a number of users are. So um, yeah, I I understand your reasoning for especially if you're making an appliance just running bare metal. It's easier. It's yeah. That's all I have today. I just wanted to join and say hi, um, give you an update. I, I joined last week, but you were on PTO. Um, and I want yeah. to thank you for all the help. I, I appreciate it. all that you're doing. And I, I owe you an update as well. And I'm sure I'm going to get that, that up to you this week. Yeah, well, I, I, I owe everybody more work on that too, because I, uh, I, I ended up having a ton of PTO I had to use. So I, uh, I, I kind of you know stopped working on it, but now it's time to go back and try to wrap up some of that. Uh, also for Quincy, we we're going to try to you know at least be able to showcase um, a, a lot of <laughs> Quincy is going to look better than Pacific, especially on the right path due to the work that Gabby did. But it's also going to hide some of our sins from backports, I think, <laughs> that we we saw. So um, there's probably more work to do there, even if the numbers look better. <laughs> got it. Got it. Well, I have I have to run in, in nine minutes for another call. Um, but like I said, okay. and I'm glad you got a, got around to you know. Um, my comments on the chat again, and I, I appreciate everything you're doing. I, it's a real pain on you know on, on us, and I know on you too to try to track this stuff down. It really, yeah. Really Long term, if if there's time to do it, and it's always down at the bottom of this, the the pile, but um, it'd be really nice to make an automated system for uh, doing performance bisects. Just have it you know walk through doing benchmarks and then like downloading new versions of stuff and and like just you know go through the whole process in an automated way that would be so so nice <laughs> yeah we, we have a benchmarking tool that we use that i'm trying to integrate as part of our ci cd pipeline for when we we do new stuff builds to have some sort of baseline that we track um, okay i'm hoping to release some of that to the community this year um for what it's worth um, yeah that'd be that'd be great yeah it's it's, it's it uses uh it speaks native rados so um rather than some sort of other abstractions i think That'll be probably valuable. We'll, we'll see if the community likes it. If not, it's useful for us still. You know? <laughs> yeah. What I've got a, a test that I wrote that 
live in the Ceph test object store uh, world that are really useful for for looking at like OMAP and and um, and kind of the behavior that we see there. Uh, but we probably want that to exist as something that you can test against an existing cluster, not just as you know like the standalone test. Right. Um, I don't know if if the 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 tool that you've got or the, the code you've written uh, looks looks at any of that kind of thing, X editors or OMAP or anything, but that would be that'd be a really really useful test to to be able to run. Let me let me let me hit up Harry as our you know title chief scientist, but he, he's the guy who wrote wrote the application. Let me, let me hit him up and see what he has to say on that. Yeah, fantastic. That'd be great. Cool. All right. All right. Um, okay. Oh, hey, Gabby, you're here. I don't hear you, Gabby. Well, thanks, Mark. I'm going to drop, and I'll have an update to you by end of week. Okay, sounds great. Uh, thanks, Kenneth. Have have a have a good meeting. All right. Thanks. See ya. Bye bye. Gabby, I, I see that you're you're out in the real world somewhere, uh, you know, probably enjoying fresh air. Yeah, no worries. I um uh since since you were on PTO and and Adam uh, is on PTO, I figured um that we'd maybe wait to discuss uh, your proposal. Uh, if you want to, uh, it's fine. Um. It, Whatever, whatever you prefer to do. Maybe in the meantime, while oh, Gabby's figuring out his mic issues, um, I'll give just a brief update um, on Crimson and and uh, Science Store. So uh, Josh and I talked earlier this week. Uh, Josh Durgan and I talked earlier this week about trying to uh, showcase uh, kind of the upper half of the Crimson stack a little bit better than what we've been able to do in the past. Uh, so right now, Cyan Store doesn't really kind of showcase it super well. It's not bad, but it's not really, um, you know, as, as fast as maybe it could be. So Earlier this week, I went back and reran some tests, uh, specifically on Science Store and Crimson, just to see kind of where we're at right now. And um, the results were, were kind of interesting. Um, let me quick get some of the numbers that I gathered. Um, I'll throw these in the just in the chat window here. Um, uh, didn't copy properly. There we go. So this is just 64k random reads and 4k random reads and 64k random writes and 4k random writes. And um, the best results out of this were definitely the 4k random. That's what we've seen in the past. We're getting about 66,000 IAPs out of one core. That's higher than we've done, I think, on classic OSDs ever. Uh, and you know, of course, this is in memory, right? So it's you know not not completely reasonable, but it's it's not bad. Um, what was interesting is that in both the 64k random read case and in the 4k random read case, we saw send message as the primary consumer of wall clock time. In the 64k random read case, it was like 99% were were stuck in send message. Don't know why. Those numbers will probably increase dramatically when we figure out whatever whatever it is that we're doing that's making send message just consume huge amounts of time. In the 4K random read case, it's like 25%. So there's still a really big advantage if we can figure out why that part of the, the stack is, is taking so much time. Uh, we're probably going to see some pretty big advantages there. On the write path side, 
what I'm seeing is that we are spending a significant amount of time in uh, bufferless substring of. That code is basically splitting up bufferless. Uh, there, there's a couple of while loops in there where we're just kind of iterating and creating new buffer pointers, if I remember right. Um, so we're here, I'll, I'll link the line of code in science store. Um, this is basically where we're doing that. I'm not totally sure yet on what the right approach is to improve this. It was about 14% of the overall wall clock time was being spent in that portion of the code. Otherwise, um, we're kind of spread over a bunch of different stuff, uh, peering code, uh, just memory allocation code and freeing um, X adders and OMAP, interestingly enough, like this being um, RBD. Uh, age object T comparisons, just a whole slew of random different things. So um, the big one was this substring in buffer list, figuring out why that's, that's so, um, uh, there's so much overhead there. But uh, the good news is that it looks like there's some interesting things to explore, both um, in the read path and on the write path. But I think we can maybe do better. I'm not sure how much better, but I think we can make it more efficient. So um, I was, I've was i been talking to Adam a little bit about uh, this problem, erratic as well, um, and then also about whether or not we can figure out how to shorten the path in the upper half of the stack, being from the network buffer down into uh, the object store. Uh, that's kind of the direction I want to go as I, I do this investigation, is to see if there are ways that we can improve and shorten the path there. Uh, I don't know if it will work or not, but that's kind of the, 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 the approach I'm taking right now. Um, anyway, uh, that, that's about it for that. Any, any questions on that or, or thoughts or comments? All right, well then, if, if not, um, Gabby, I guess, uh, is not going to have luck with his mic right now, so maybe we'll wait till next week to, to do, uh, to talk about his proposal. Um, that's all I have. Would anyone else like to ha have any topics or have anything that they would like to talk about with the group? I have a topic related to uh, an issue that we saw uh, on a Pacific cluster in production that seems to be related to RocksDB performance uh, on bucket listings for RGW. And uh, it sounded like this was the right platform for talking about that. Absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah, so let me just give you a little context about the, the scenario that we encountered. We were on a Pacific 1627 cluster in production. Uh, we had a customer that was using a Veeam client and was doing backups, writing about 50 megabytes per second constantly for a week or two. And at the time, we saw issues. They had about 20 million objects in the bucket. And then their bucket listing started timing out after we fixed an issue with BI list. It was a, it was a backport that we patched in. That was kind of a known issue. So, uh, the, the Veeam client was doing like one bucket listing per second on this bucket. And when we looked into it, basically, this is what we saw in the logs. I'll copy and paste this into the chat. And so essentially, what you pull out of that is that these upper and lower bound calls in Blue Store, which end up being iterator calls in RacksDB, were taking like 10 seconds each. And on some OSDs, we saw them go up to like 15 plus seconds. Uh, and so those are both called in that same logic. So an individual bucket listing for getting back up to the maximum of a thousand objects was taking like 30 seconds in some cases. And for the whole bucket, it was just taking forever. So on the relevant OSDs, we saw they were using one core 100% CPU. Uh, this bucket index pool was deployed on NVMe and those weren't like touched at all. They were barely doing anything. 
uh, and we were seeing a lot of extra space consumption on the bucket index pool as well when we were doing a DF. Um, so basically, ultimately, we blocked the client. We restarted all RGW instances and did a rolling shutdown of all the OSDs and did manual RocksDB compaction. And after that, we were seeing that the listings were taking like eight milliseconds again. So it was like a yeah. huge, huge, huge decrease. Yep. The, a few a few times after that, it regressed back to the same point where it was taking forever again, and it seems like various things could cause it to get back in that state, one being scrubs, another one resharding, another one cluster upgrades. It almost seemed like any pressure on the OSDs could cause it to get back into this bad loop where it was taking forever for these listings. And so our working theory that we haven't proven is that there's tons of OMAP entries and the compactions just aren't able to actually clear stuff potentially because they're active iterators. And so it becomes more and more likely that they're active iterators as it gets slower and eventually pretty much impossible for the compaction to actually remove all the objects. But that's just the theory. We haven't been able to actually like prove it. So I just want to get like feedback and see if you guys knew of these issues, this kind of stuff rang about or had ideas for us to try or get more information. What we've seen in the past is that this is almost always tombstones, that there are all of these tombstone entries for deletes that you end up iterating over, and it makes the iteration extremely slow. And then when you compact, it gets rid of all that junk that's in there. It actually, you know, reduces the working set that you're iterating over, and then all of a sudden things are fast again. Um, it was a really, really big problem when we were trying to do um, <clears throat> Like the uh, the the oh shoot um, like bulk deletes um, delete range we were trying to implement that we this came up like as a huge huge issue um, I think uh, we've talked about it in this meeting before and Igor had mentioned the possibility of um, of like constant background compaction that we right now is triggered when you end up with like a ton of writes coming in right you have the the um, the mem tables grow big enough that it triggers compaction, flushing and compaction. But what we really need is we we need the ability to when when there's like a delete workload coming in and you have all of these tombstones, you really want compaction to happen after you've accumulated like a certain number of them. I think that's the solution that we need. I'm guessing that's what you're hitting. It sure sounds like it. Yeah. Well. It is interesting. We see in the logs that compactions are happening, but apparently they're not doing the compaction to the extent that it does when we shut down the OSD and do it manually. And I don't know why that is, but we did see like in um, RocksDB documentation that having iterators open causes compaction to not be able to delete a lot of the files because the iterator is holding on to stuff, essentially. So the yeah. idea was maybe like right. we need mutual exclusion when the compaction happens to make sure at least at some cadence there are no iterators open so it can do a full compaction. That would be a pretty huge uh, design problem in RocksDB at the, to be emerging at this late stage. Sorry, Matt, Matt which, which problem specifically? Uh, the idea that, that, that it simply has no way to, 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 to to partition work between compaction and income and, and active readers. It's simply if it's simply if it simply degrades, and readers constantly win. I think it'll be really important to make sure that the compaction that you're seeing is actually on the same range as that you're reading, right? Because you might be seeing compactions, but is it in? Is it actually compacting the things that you're thinking are compacting, or are they compacting like a different portion? Of the database yeah i don't know for sure the answer to that so we'll have to look uh in more detail and verify that that's a good point but but matt that that's also a concern that it's if you have tons and tons of iterators open what happens when you try to compact i'm guessing that it is a problem well yeah, yeah but if it's an unsolved problem at this stage that's really it's really a holler <laughs> Well, what what do you do about that though? Like from our perspective, what can we do about that? Um, 
you'd, you'd have you'd have to do you have to, you have to you have to implement it. It's sort of like reader writer locks. I mean, you have to you have to you have to implement a fairness, a fairness strategy. In this case, it, the primary place to put it would be in the RocksDB interface. You might be able to assimilate it. So yeah, I I guess my take on this is first we should just make sure that it's actually compacting the ranges that you're actually holding iterators open for. Um, that'd be maybe the first thing to figure out. But um, the next thing to maybe figure out would be, um, sorry, Igor, do you remember we were talking about this before? I think we were talking about trying to introduce some kind of background compaction um, after like a certain amount. Go ahead. Well, well, actually that's mostly what my PR optimizing PG removal does, but this specific case, I'm pretty sure it's active iterators which prevent from compacting. Um, background compaction wouldn't help. I highly likely it wouldn't help in this case. So, you, um, Igor, do you think it is? It is actually due to holding iterators open. I mean, it sounded like to me like I, when they did stuff, it it degraded, right? That was the problem. Is that it fixed it when they did offline background compaction, but then it degraded over time again. So, uh, as far as I understand, uh, uh, offline compaction helped for a while, uh, and it looks like some background compaction is happening online, but it doesn't help. And, well, you might want to try another one background compaction to, to, to see if it helps again. Uh, and now the question what prevents online compaction from uh, bringing this benefit? I, I recall some uh, complaints about online compactions being ineffective to deal with these stones. So, and I, I, I didn't perform a broad investigation, but uh, it looks like uh, active iterators might impact that badly. I guess the question I have, though, is, I mean, how often is it that we're going to have iterators open, like, constantly, where we can't have a background compaction actually be useful? Well, I think it depends on the use case and on the user load. So we don't have any active iterators at USD level, probably, but I'm not sure about the GW. Maybe I guess it, it keeps uh, iterators open indeed. From what I remember, uh, some of our worst case scenarios are where we like have an iterator open for a while, and then we end up like going back and reiterating over the same range, and then just like going a little farther than we did previously. And we do this over and over and over again. But you can imagine that in between that, especially if we're doing work in between, like we're deleting something at the end, and then we reiterate, you, it seems like there should be a, the ability in between those to be able to do a compaction. But, uh, but the question, uh, who is responsible for triggering compaction uh, properly at, at exactly the moment when you are between the iterators? Yeah. So, as far as I understand, it's just periodic, some, it's just some periodic application uh, from RocksDB. I think we need to trigger on deletes. That's the big thing in my mind. Uh, well, again, that's what my PR uh, does for PG removal. Uh, we might can probably extend that to other bulk deletes. Uh, but again, uh, if, if, if the issue is uh, in open uh, iterators, then it might be inefficient as well. 
So yeah, we need, we need some some. Well, I don't know even how. So we we should probably refactor the use case from Rados users. Uh, we, we we should avoid uh, long ter uh, term uh, I, I, yeah they should reset there, the, the, the edit trials i mean we sh we should absolutely not be holding iterators open for any real length of time that's that's probably a bug if we're doing that anywhere so i mean at least as far as our theory goes it seems to be kind of a positive feedback loop, right? Because once you cross some threshold of these iterations taking a long time, in our case, it got up to like 15 seconds in some cases. Now, like just one iteration over a thousand objects is taking 15 seconds and there's these two calls back to back. So that's like 30 seconds where you have iterators open. And then the client is making calls once every second in our case. So we're never getting ahead because they're all taking forever. Now you're almost certain to always have iterators always open. So if you're doing compactions in the background randomly, there's like a really, really good chance that when you try to do it, there's gonna be an iterator open and the problem keeps getting worse and worse because the queue keeps getting more full and the and the iterations keep taking longer. Yeah. I have a I, feeling. I, I, oh, go ahead, Igor. Just an interesting point. Uh, so actually it's, an open question what what's the primary uh, issue is it open uh, iterators preventing compaction or it's a, a large amount of tombstones uh, which cause iterators to Leave longer, and this actually prevents compaction. Uh, Igor, I think the, 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 that's a, uh, a cycle which becomes worse and worse. So... Igor, I think Corey's right. Right, like if you aren't packing after a lot of deletes, you start out by doing all this iteration and deletes. You iterate and then delete and iterate and delete. But then you're never compacting after the deletes because there's no write workload. Then it's making the iteration take longer, and like it's, it is, exactly would be a feedback loop, right? And well, uh, maybe one more question uh, about data removal. Uh, so, what is causing removal in your cluster? Uh, are you moving PG? maybe removing some pools or that's a regular use case from rgw so uh, previously the major uh, issue with bulk removals was due to pool removal or pg, PG uh, moving but honestly i've never seen uh, user remo user data removal to cause something like that. I'm curious, what what kind of removals yeah. do you have? Yeah, and I don't know the specific answer of what uh, at the lowest level what they look like, but it is it's a Veeam client doing backups, and like I said, they're doing like 50 megabytes per second, so they're doing a lot of uh, writes constantly. And uh, this is a versioned bucket, so I don't know if it's part of the versioning uh, stuff that's kept in OMAP that is constantly well, being updated or deleted. Well, that's a very important piece. Do they require a version? Bu uh, they must be creating it as a version bucket. Do they know what they're doing there? And Suppo Supposedly, yes. I mean, supposedly our, our uh, solution architect sales team have talked to them about that, and they think they need that, so... Well, it's certainly very expensive, um, and, 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 and yeah, it has, um, that, that doesn't, doesn't, allow, doesn't allow our implementation to, of directory sharding to scale as effectively as we would hope. If they, although if they generate enough data in there, at least it's, at least it's, at least it's going to eventually spread out. <coughs> but, 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 but versions of the same object end up on the same bucket index shard. And that, that's, that's probably not changing anytime soon. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a concern. <coughs> But it, 
But then if they don't, and if they don't prove, prune old versions, then um, which was which was then becomes their response becomes someone's responsibility. Uh, if if but this this but this can be managed by a policy. Uh, if VM doesn't already do it, it could be fold, folded in somehow. If it could tolerate deletion of older of old versions using the lifecycle method, do so uh, on some more appropriate schedule. That would that that could that could that could burn down a lot of that. Matt, can you can you think of um, a scenario using versioned um, uh, uh, buckets here where um, we would see a lot of deletes coming in at the same time, but not a lot of writes? Well, sure, that would be in fact the case I just described. If they do, if, if for example, in, in an AWS environment, the way you contain, you know, the 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 the, 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 the growth of indexes versioning. Is, is that you install a lifecycle rule that applies to non-current versions and sets a date on them? Then they'll all, then 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 the expiring then then whatever you know version object names that expired at the same time will go will go away more or less at once. Okay, that's one way. But the, but the, but any but of course anything a backup program will 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 do will have workflows that'll look like that too. It'll decide it's going to blow away a whole bunch of names <laughs> that it's got in, the, in a volume or something, and then it'll just burn them all off. Yeah, yeah. But right now, I think I think the the reality of all of this is that we're so reliant on writes to trigger compaction, and we don't do it on reads or sorry, on, well, on, on deletes rather. Um, that that when we see tons of deletes coming in at once, it can just basically completely destroy iteration performance. I mean, this is this is this is all very meaningful stuff, and I, and I don't have anywhere to add to it. But I did want wonder, Corey, if you knew anything, but the, from the application side of it, if you'd seen anything suspicious in the in the listing, like you know, range of name, you know, in the listing that, the requests that you cut that you see coming in, if if they if they seem if they seem to be requesting new new listing ranges, or you know, if, if they're asking if they're consistently asking for new data all the time, or if they maybe or aren't. <laughs> They're, they're definitely prefix listings, like, so they have some prefix query. Um, beyond that, I, I didn't look at them super closely, but I can go back and see if there's anything interesting and share some stuff with you, if that's potentially useful. Well, it's, it's interesting if it looks, if it looks, if there's anything about it looks, it looks suspicious. Like when you say like they're sending in listings every second, I mean, if that is, that is, that is because the workload is a saturating workload, or is there something... Yeah, well, that's unexpected about that. <laughs> well, we actually have some meetings with the Veeam uh, guys tomorrow. Uh, our company is a partner with Veeam and stuff, and we have some close relationships. So we're actually going to talk about that with them tomorrow, try to understand their client behavior better, and if it can be improved from their side, because we're also unsure why they're doing so many bucket listings. Well, what, um, I'm, what I'm doing, yeah. actually, I'll just share this. What I'm, 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 I'm about... And the first cut implementation of um, of uh, um, 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 I forget what it what it's actually called um, uh, server inventory, um, which 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 does which 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 materializes listings or lifecycle uh, into uh, into objects. That are then uh, that are in CSV or Parquet for for us, or it could be ORC to do up in, in, in AWS. Um, we, we we also have certification by Veeam, but I don't I've never talked to Veeam developers, at least not, not that I knew of. Um, it would if, if they if they if they would be if they are prepared to use server inventory um, already, um, then I probably have the solution to this <laughs> because one of the solutions is offload. So um, I, I just took a look, and there's in RocksDB there's what's called TTL compaction, which is basically just you know after a certain amount of time, and there's not been any compaction, do it. And then um, it looks like in the last two years there's maybe a way in RocksDB um, to de compact on deletion. Um, I haven't actually looked at this real closely. Uh, I just found this um, in the chat window. Um, it 
I, I'll have to look at this more closely, but it looks like they know about it um, upstream in RocksDB. So there, there may be a couple of options that don't actually require Ceph to trigger the compaction. You might be able to do it yourself um, with some options. Do you remember last meeting there were talks about uh, detail of uh... yeah that was where I was uh, where I started trying to remember the options action maybe maybe this can be helpful here as well yeah um, I was just trying to see if I could find the the way to set that I don't remember. what the option is for doing this, but I know it exists. Igor, do you remember, did, does that require any uh, programmatic changes to enable that? I, I don't remember off the top of my head if you can just do it as a, a runtime option. Another term that was used uh, in, in their documentation was periodic compaction. Oh, Corey, I see that you pasted um, another yeah, SC performance degradation with deletes. That's exactly what we're talking about. Yeah, we came across that at some point while we were trying to find relevant things for the issue. It sounds pretty relevant. Yeah, it's, it's the exact same thing, I think. Um, so, yeah, the term TTL compaction and periodic compaction are probably worth looking for. Um, oh, yep, and they referenced right at the end of that in February, 20, February 20th, 2021, so that's like a month old. Uh, I didn't find many references surrounding new compact on deletion collector factory. That's the, the, the new thing that they're talking about for deleting or co uh, compacting on deletion. Uh, and then, yeah, no, no one replied to the request for an example on how to use it. <laughs> This is more than a year old, so it's 21. Uh, oh, you're right. I was, I was, I, I'm getting my years up. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, that's surprising. Um, so I think the question is, can we avoid having to do this ourselves? I know we can trigger compactions if we have to ourselves, so we can write something to do this and fix this, kind of like what Igor was describing he's done um, on the PG side. But we probably need to do this more generically in the RocksDB uh, uh, interface that we have. Or maybe we can just, it will be really nice and much better is if we could just tell the RocksDB to, to do this itself. So Corey, I guess maybe the next step would be, let's see if we can figure out if there's some way to tell RocksDB to do some periodic compactions or or use this this fancy uh, undelete compaction thing. Um, that might be, might be the next steps to just see if that can improve the situation for you. Um, and if we can't make that work, then then we might need to adopt and get something into the code that that does it um, does it ourselves. Okay, that sounds good. The only other thing I wanted to um, to uh, throw out there was the the version of RocksDB on Pacific is like two years old, and I think it's 6.81, and the latest is 6.29. Do we think there's 
any value in upgrading that in case there's anything on the RocksDB side that has already been uh, updated and improved? I didn't see anything specific in the change logs, but there's a lot of stuff, so I don't know. There might be. It's it's always a little bit um, uh, uh, frightening upgrading the RocksDB version. Um, in the past, granted, we this was an intermediate version between the releases we had upgraded to, and it actually introduced a, a regression that caused data corruption, and we ended up having to uh, put our own patch that that like um, reverted uh, uh, the the database version basically because it wasn't backwards compatible. Um, that doesn't typically happen with the release versions. That was kind of a, a no no on our part that we we upgraded to an intermediate release. Um, so so you know lesson learned there. But um, we've always just since then been a little bit gun shy about you know pulling in a new RocksDB version into like a backport. I, I think we've done it before, but we really like testing master before we, we do that, just to make sure that there's nothing crazy coming in. Um, so if we did that, we'd probably first backport to like, you know, whatever version is being used in Quincy uh, and backport that to Pacific rather than the newest. But if, if there is something specific that's new, that's really worth getting in, you know, that's probably then a discussion we should have and, and figure out if we can get that into into master and testing there first and then bake it and then and then backcourt it. Okay, yeah, that's fair. Um, All right, I will I will keep looking into the, the options and stuff like you suggested and I'll see if I can get some more data together around like compactions and stuff, what we're seeing in terms of ranges and put it together in a common place in case anyone else wants to look at it and see if they see anything that we might miss. Yeah, and Corey, you're not alone. This is this is kind of an issue that has appeared in different different ways in uh, under different circumstances. You know, it's especially if you're doing a lot of iteration for whatever reason, it, it tends to crop up and it, it it gets mitigated if you're doing writes at the same time because then you're, you're triggering compaction regularly. So it's really the use case where if you've got lots of deletes and lots of iteration and no writes, that's that's when we tend to see this kind of thing. Yeah. All right, well, thanks for all the, the input and discussion on that. I appreciate it. Cool, yeah, hopefully we can we can get it worked out for you quickly and, and uh, you know, just get this, issue generally taken care of. It's we can't have a thorn on our side. So all right. Um anything else from anybody before we wrap up? All right, well then thank you everybody for coming. Uh and have a great week. And uh next week we'll we'll talk about Gabby and Adam's uh, ideas for PG log. Uh that's it. Have a great week, everyone. Bye. Okay. Thanks, Mark.